Everyday Samurai, Episode 19. <music> Greetings, friends. Glad to have you with us today. And welcome to Everyday Samurai, in service to your liberty and the security of a free state. Thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing the show. Our numbers are growing, and no doubt that is a result of you taking the time to tell a friend or some of you think will benefit from a message aimed at awakening the consciousness of peace and prosperity protected by enlightened warriors. It is also a testament to the community of like-minded seekers on the dual path of Bunbu Ryodo, or scholarly and martial arts in the samurai tradition. By exploring universal principles found in both edge weapons combat and the praxeology of political economy, we can find practical means toward realizing our goals at the individual and social levels. In this way, we promote our own well-being and contribute to the enhancement of the community, what was once understood as the common wheel, or what later became the political organization known as a commonwealth. When you think about it, a commonwealth is a good way to look at the purpose of government. While wealth is oftentimes lambasted for connotations of greed and obsessions with money, wealth in the truest sense is so much more than this. It encompasses everything that goes into human well-being. Health, peace of mind, a sense of belonging, happy relationships, as well as material comforts and financial resources are included in the concept of well-being. This is true wealth. Anyone familiar with basic psychology or sociology will more than likely have come across the works of Dr. Abraham Maslow and his Hierarchy of Needs theory. Even if this is new to you, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs is really just well-organized common sense and you'll easily get the concept as I move through the levels. They are physiological, safety, social, esteem, self-actualization, and ultimately, transcendence. I'll explain each one in more detail presently, and as I do, keep in mind that each level needs to be largely satisfied prior to moving on to the next. Before I go through these levels, however, let me just say that one of the quickest ways to accelerate your success in life, to get into self-actualization and transcendence, is through a consistent practice of meditation. This is especially true for the modern warrior because of all the constant stress and number of sensory inputs bombarding you on a daily basis. The samurai adopted Zen as a way to calm the mind, develop their awareness, and face their challenges resolutely. This is something you can do also thanks to the technology of Zen 12. You can get a full hour's worth of masterful meditation done in just 12 minutes. So check out everydaysamurai.life forward slash zen12 today. Whether you are an experienced meditator or someone who really doesn't know much about it, Zen 12 will ensure you get all the benefits simply by listening with headphones while you relax. It's the perfect way to de-stress post-mission or after a long day. You know it's good for you, so go to everydaysamurai.life forward slash zen12 and get a free sample of this amazing meditation technology. All right, beginning with the physiological, these include things necessary to sustain the human organism, such as food, water, sleep, shelter, and the sexual acts needed to propagate the species. Next comes safety needs. These include health and well-being, personal security, emotional balance, financial resources, and safety from accidents or illness. Once these needs are largely satisfied comes social belonging and the bonds of family, friends, groups, and personal intimacy. This is also why social ostracism is such a strong deterrent to antisocial behavior. The need for belonging compels people to act in ways acceptable to social conventions and customs. It is also another reason why a shared culture is so important to social cohesion. Moving up the pyramid to esteem, we notice that within one's social groups, the need to be respected recognized and viewed with a level of prestige so that we are more than just an accepted member of these groups, but a person of value within them. These include recognition of our strength, confidence, and skill not only internally but externally validated by others within our social circles. From there, we move up the pyramid to the next level for self-actualization. 
These include the ability to find a mate, use our abilities and talents, express our inspirations and aspirations, pursue and achieve goals, find happiness, and otherwise shape our world. Self-actualization also builds upon the previous levels, reinforcing them by showing others the effects of our potency in life. Later on in Maslow's career, he developed another level to the model and redefined self-actualization in what he termed transcendence. This is actually a higher level where the individual not only controls, directs, and achieves self-actualization in a material sense, but also understands his or her place in the universe. So much so that they feel a deep connection with all of creation and the cosmos in what some might call a spiritual sense. It's important to remember that one cannot move up to the next level until the baser needs are largely satisfied. This is not to say that all of the items listed in each category need to be fully fulfilled before moving on, but that one cannot move forward unless they feel secure at the lower level. We can also use political economy to illustrate the phenomenon in practice. So, imagine that Robinson Crusoe washes up on a deserted island after being shipwrecked. He may have been dreaming about some deep philosophical concept that he wanted to share with the world right before he found himself effectively naked and afraid in this new, harsh environment. Obviously, he has to set aside his lofty aspirations until he can ensure the means of sustaining his life. Since he has been baking in the sun on a hot, sandy beach, his first priority will likely be finding drinkable water. Therefore, he has to let go of his self-actualization desires until he can satisfy his physiological imperatives. Similarly, he might have grandiose ideas about fishing with a trawler or a sailboat, but until he builds up the resources sufficient to sustain his life and get out of the harsh elements, he cannot stop searching for food and shelter long enough to start building a boat. He must first come up with a basic subsistence strategy before looking for ways to expand his reach. People, moving around in these sacks of skin and bone through the jungles of time, space, and form, need to satisfy the lower hierarchy of needs before moving on to the next level. Moreover, people need to understand how those needs actually get satisfied before they can set their sights on demonstrating the higher levels of mastery in life. Just like the study of martial arts, the basics of sustaining life comes first, and the next level of proficiency builds upon mastery of the basics. One can never really let go of the basics since they are the foundation upon which each succeeding level depends upon. This is where people get so confused as to what builds a wealthy, prosperous, and harmonious society. They put the proverbial cart in front of the horse and then wonder why they get perverted results. You might agree with me when looking out at the current state of affairs in the world that society is becoming less civil and less harmonious, particularly in the state of political discourse. There are lots of opinions out there, and without going into too much detail, understanding public choice economics and the variety of special interest groups involved, since many of them have vested interests in obfuscating issues so that certain groups can actually benefit from the confusion and chaos. This is why a principled approach and understanding things at a fundamental level is so important to restoring not only civility, but also an environment where peace and prosperity can arise. As we've talked about in previous episodes, martial arts are about securing a space in which individuals can live with dignity, more so than anything having to do with self-defense. Martial art is the science of government, the sole purpose of which is to protect people and their property, to create a free space where aggression, force, and fraud are dissuaded, repelled, and mitigated by those willing and able to make war on any transgressors. We've also looked at the definitions offered by Lysander Spooner for the state of war versus the state of peace. So long as there are those with designs of obtaining what rightly belongs to another by way of aggression, force, or fraud, there exists a state of war, and the legitimate use of violence is to deter or rebuke all such designs and actions. This crucial function in society is, as we know from the Declaration of Independence and the Enlightenment tradition, the sole function and single reason for contracting government into existence. In the United States, the Republican form of government relied upon the whole body of the people, except for a few public officials, to, as Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 of the Constitution clearly indicates, execute the laws, repel invasions, and suppress insurrections. 
This means that everyone in the United States, anyway, has the contractual obligation to perform in service of self-government. When you actually think about it, in light of what we know from the science of political economy, a discipline that has evolved much since the Constitution was ratified in 1789, that this is the only way that people can actually be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. Outsourcing and relying upon bureaucracies that, as bastions of socialist organizational management, leads to perverse outcomes specifically because they cannot rationally allocate resources to their most highly valued ends. It's important to remember that the customer is the one that dictates what those highly valued ends are. When left to politicians and bureaucrats, the ends get distorted and the means get diverted to service special interest groups and the corruption inherent to political control. This need not be evil or of a deliberately diabolical design either. When we understand the principles of political economy, we don't necessarily need to appeal to some conspiracy theory to understand why we get such perverse outcomes by relying upon bureaucracies for our own security and well-being. I will relay a story from a friend in the Florida Army National Guard that was recently mobilized to deal with a hurricane disaster. Not only are these National Guard members Florida residents, most of whom have families and properties that needed to be attended to during a time of crisis, but they are also able-bodied workers and entrepreneurs that have, potentially at least, jobs serving customers and building wealth. Yet during this mobilization, as the story goes, the bulk of their time was spent waiting in a large convention center while the bureaucracy tried to figure out what to do with all these soldiers. My time in the Army National Guard validates the tremendous waste of time spent standing around, and anyone with military experience is familiar with the phrase, hurry up and wait, because that is what wasteful bureaucracies have their people doing. It also harkens back to the massive response to Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans some years back. Firefighters, EMTs, and other first responders from all over the country went to New Orleans to help out during this time of crisis. Yet when FEMA took over and tried to centrally plan relief efforts, the first responders were absurdly bussed out of the disaster zone and over to Atlanta so that they could first receive briefings on sexual harassment and other useless administrivia. Everyone in law enforcement and the military can recognize how much training is put towards issues that have nothing to do with protecting people or their property, or enhancing the lethality, efficiency, or unit cohesion of what are supposed to be instruments of security and justice. Everyone has at one time or another in their career scratched their head in disbelief at some cockamamie policy or program and said, your tax dollars at work. Leaving decision-making authority over resources and assets ostensibly available for security and justice to politicians and bureaucrats inevitably leads to inefficiencies because of their inability to rationally calculate or direct efforts towards satisfying authentic consumer demand. This is the baseline that obliterates all socialism, economic calculation. Everything that follows from that could include, but is certainly not limited to, corruption, embezzlement, conspiracy, and even tyranny. Yet these harmful products are downstream of the root cause, which is the turning over to government what should rightly be handled by either the people themselves or their directly contracted surrogates. The outsourcing to bureaucracy and political control of security functions has directly contributed to the emergence of disharmony and insecurity currently on display in modern society. Not only have the offices and institutions been derelict in their responsibility to arm, organize, and train we the people to fulfill our obligations in service to the security of a free state, but most people have been lulled into ignorance of the crucial role each citizen plays in the cycle of self-government. It should come as no surprise, then, that the functioning of a constitutional republic is in such disrepair when the institutions deemed necessary to the security of a free state have been removed from their crucial role. Nevertheless, at some point, everyone will have to look to their own security, and the increase in social unrest and injustice will only accelerate the amount of people asking for a solution. Thankfully, at least for the people of the United States, the remedies are already at hand, 
and integral to the supreme law of the land. Authentic martial artists that understand training and readiness are part of protecting the commonweal are sometimes few and far between. It is easy to get lost in the art, which is putting self-actualization and transcendence ahead of the more fundamental aspects of Maslow's hierarchy of needs model. Too often, I think, martial art training becomes engrossed in self-expression and moving meditation while forgetting that the real purpose of martial art is self-government, signified by the protection of people and their property from aggression and fraud. Similarly, martial art organizations can be corrupted in a variety of ways. Organizational politics and parochialism exists in almost every organization, not just government or bureaucracy. This too is an example of putting self-actualization and esteem ahead of more fundamental needs. I will now convey some wisdom from an Aikido teacher that relays a story from the founder and also discusses organizational corruption. It was written by Gaku Homa, chief instructor of the Nippon Kan in Denver, Colorado. Homa Kancho was one of the last Uchideshi or live-in students attending to the founder of Aikido, Morihei Ueshiba Osensei. Quote, one morning, the founder announced loudly, I want to go to Hombu. He had suddenly decided that he was going to the Aikikai headquarters in Tokyo. As usual, he asked his wife for some money to make the trip, and as usual, he said when she gave him the money, that is not enough. It costs about 20,000 Japanese yen, or about $200, to travel to Tokyo from Iwama. This would pay for the train and taxi fare, food, and a donation to the Yamoto Kyo Tokyo branch. The founder's wife would always retrieve the money and give the money to me for safekeeping. I will always remember those heartwarming negotiations between the founder and his wife over the fare to Tokyo. It was the same every time. It is kind of hard to imagine the founder, a great teacher and leader of the martial art world of Aikido, acting very childlike with his wife over train fare. The founder's wife would always give him the money, but would usually reply with one of her favorite sayings. Quote, we need to think of our komebitsu, close quote. About ten years later, Morihiro Saito Shihan told me that the founder often used to say to him, do not teach budo if you are worried about your komebitsu. The word komebitsu literally means rice box. Traditionally in Japan, the rice that families lived on was stored in the komebitsu. During the time of the samurai, salaries were often paid in rice instead of money. The samurai would take the rice to the market after being paid and sell it for money. Therefore, the word komebitsu refers to the food or means for survival, or in plainer terms, the money we use for living. Now, skipping ahead in, in the article to where Homa Kancho is asked about how to run a successful dojo, it seems that the profitability of the martial art business is on the decline. Most of the inquiries are questions about how to run a successful independent dojo and how to market and attract students. There is no simple recipe on how to run a successful independent dojo, so there is no way to answer this question simply. In the U.S., it is common when visiting someone's house, for example, to compliment the host and hostess on a delicious dinner and ask the hostess for the recipe. This is a compliment in the U.S. In Japan... Asking the host or hostess for the recipe is very bad manners and is considered quite rude as it insinuates that all that is needed to make the delicious dish is the recipe. It insinuates that anyone with the recipe can make this delicious dish and achieve the same results and that the talent and experience and heart of the host does not matter. In Japan, cooking is a do, just like aikido, budo, chado, etc., the spirit and heart and path is as intrinsic to the creation as any recipe. Therefore, in Japan, recipes are usually not shared, but since I am getting old, it is not so necessary to keep everything to myself. Instead, I will share more about the story of Komebitsu. Following the advice that Saito Shihan gave me when Nippon Kan Dojo moved to its new location, I also opened a restaurant and started other income-producing endeavors to fill the Komebitsu and stabilized dojo operations. Morihiro Saito Shihan himself owned a dry cleaning business, a sushi bar, and a soba restaurant. All of these businesses provided the income stability for him to teach Aikido around the world while his rice box remained full. 
Also, with Uchideshi coming from all over the world, these other businesses allowed him to be able to take care of them. What can we learn from Saito Shihan's Komebitsu example? If you're thinking about becoming a professional Aikido instructor or opening your own dojo, with no other source of income to help support you is a very difficult thing to do. If you dream of making a living as an Aikido instructor, even if you are a very good Aikidoist and have achieved a high rank, long-term success is not easy. Again, skipping ahead. It is not a problem of individual talent or spiritual strength, but one of economic reality. Without other sources of income, it is difficult to maintain an Aikido dojo for a long period as a sole source of one's livelihood. Aikido does not have tournaments and does not attract sponsors or governmental financial support. Without other sources of income, the teaching of Aikido relies on teaching fees, promotion and testing fees, belt fees, seminar fees, and of course, organization dues. This is the reality of teaching Aikido. To maintain a dojo, pay rent, insurance, utilities, upkeep, living expenses, and even support a family is very difficult in today's world, even with a dojo of 50 to 100 students. Once the relationship between instructor and student becomes a business relationship where the instructor must rely on marketing and customer service to survive, the instructor's original spirit and dream for teaching can become degraded. In the end, this path can lead to a closed dojo and debts to repay. Another danger when teaching of Aikido falls prey to customer business for survival is, as can happen in any relationship where money is involved, collusion and corruption are also always a possibility. For example, all over the world in our global Aikido community, the selling of Don ranking is quite a big business. I have taught Aikido all over the world and I have seen and experienced practice with many different Aikido groups and dojos. Most dojos have organizational ties to large Aikido franchises, like the Aikikai, and I have taught at Aikikai dojos in many countries. About 90% of these groups have had problems within their own organizations that have stemmed more often than not from problems with money, problems with too many levels of hierarchy wanting a larger and larger piece of the pie. In my experience, when there is a hierarchical structure in organizations, each tier of the hierarchy turn more and more of their time and energy into obtaining and collecting money, and conflicts arise. Conflicts over affiliation and money have divided our Aikido community, and in some countries there are multiple Aikido organizations that have split off from one another, becoming competitors to each other, and ultimately dissipating and mutating their own teaching and influence. The other 10% of the dojo I have seen are Aikido dojos that are stable, most often because they have additional sources of income to supplement their teaching of Aikido. In other words, they do not worry about their komebitsu, which in most cases has been part of their recipe for success. Along with the problems I have seen that arise from money is what has become the business of Don ranking. Many times I have seen dojos organized by people who had the money to attend enough seminars and make enough donations to buy a high degree of rank instead of earning it through practice and training. Dojos with money have the ability to invite a high-ranking Japanese shihan from Japan to do ranking promotions for them. Since they have the money, they have the power to be upranked quickly themselves, not by merit or skill level, but by their ability to make donations. I have met more than one high-ranking instructor that did not even know how to wear a hakama correctly. Although prolific in our modern-day Aikido community, Don ranking based on donations rather than earned merit can be found throughout the history of Aikido in Japan. Even at the time of the founder, many of the students who obtained a tenth Don were wealthy local landowners or their sons. Some of them even achieved the highest level of the rank of tenth Don by the age of 50. This practice is still prevalent in Japan today and many local prefecture branch leaders are wealthy people that can afford to pay for this honor. It is still true that it is very difficult to have a relationship with the Aikikai if you don't have the money to pay for it. I remember one senior Hombu Shihan telling me, I never worry about sake and beer in the summertime, or fresh fish too, which is delivered directly to my house. If this were the government, people would lose their jobs for accepting bribes. Many of the Shibucho, local branch leaders still today in Japan, earn their rank and titles through the power of their money. Do not teach Budo if you are worried about your komebitsu is a very important message given to us by the founder. 
Teaching as a livelihood can be a double-edged sword that all instructors must think about. Not having alternate means for financial stability can cause hardships and degrade the purest of intentions. Having the money and using it to abuse the system of rank and power can be just as bad. I am sometimes viewed as an outlaw, but I am not tied to any organization and am not bound by any hierarchical obligation. I never pressure my own students for money, and I am not dependent upon them for my livelihood. I began Nippon Kan by myself and have never received support from any large organization. I started from zero and have built from the ground up an operation that is self-sufficient. To succeed as an independent dojo takes discipline and vision. It takes discipline inside the dojo and generous outreach outside the dojo. Close quote. Here we have the idea of the komibitsu as one's own store of wealth, the nest egg from which individuals and families will sustain themselves, and there are always two aspects to its proper management. The first is the acquisition of wealth, and, as the founder of Aikido relayed, one should not make teaching of martial art their sole source of income. Entirely too many compromises follow. The second aspect is the protection and cultivation of the komibitsu, or one's own nest egg of savings. As many of you might already be aware, the current monetary environment under central banks and fractional reserve practices is inherently inflationary. For instance, the Federal Reserve Bank has a 2% annual inflation target. This means that in 10 years, the purchasing power of your money will be depleted by 20%. Simply holding money in stasis, meaning in a bank or under your mattress, is not enough to protect your komibitsu. This is another reason why, even if you are not interested in politics, politics, or I should say rightly that it's politicians and bureaucrats, are highly interested in you, and more importantly, what you have. Inflation is the stealth tax, the surreptitious way of taking your komibitsu by means of policy, and this is always done under the guise of acting toward the public good. As we've said in the past, the corollary to Sun Tzu's dictum, all war is based on deception, coupled with Clausewitz's declaration that war is politics by other means, indicates that all politics is based on deception. What politicians, bureaucrats, and the second-hand dealers in propping up the state say has only kernels of truth relating to what a policy actually does. It also means that, as Sun Tzu also states, War is the ground of life and death, the way of survival or extinction. One cannot but consider it. This is the warrior's way of saying that even if you are not interested in politics, politics is interested in you. If you are a warrior, you must ground yourself in political theory. You must study political economy because the battle is always over control of resources. You must strip away the fog of war, the confusing statements, posturing, grandiose pronouncements, and all the rest of the propaganda machine, especially the indoctrination of public education, to see cause and effect. It is not what politicians and bureaucrats say, or intend to do, that's important. It is the results that matter. Also, in an inflationary environment, you must grow your komebitsu faster than what the politicians and bureaucrats can steal through inflation. Again, there are two aspects, acquisition and cultivation both of which require protection. In other words, the warrior must embrace their entrepreneurial spirit, creating value for others in the world by offering goods and services. It's not enough to simply get a job and collect a paycheck. You need to act on your higher aspirations. The best way to get your entrepreneurial vision into action is by having a coach mentor you into adopting a success consciousness. That's what the 6 Minutes to Success program is all about. Imagine getting expert coaching delivered every day to you in bite-sized video segments to help you focus on what's important. If you go to everydaysamurai.life forward slash success, you'll see what I'm talking about. You must change your thinking to change the results you get in life. And the short daily video coaching program offered at everydaysamurai.life forward slash success is like taking a success vitamin, I suggest as part of your morning routine. Awareness is not enough. You need to set goals and make plans towards achieving them. So, go to everydaysamurai.life forward slash success today.
The last thing I wanted to talk about is that communities, societies, and nations also have a komibitsu. And as we've discussed earlier, it is known as the common wheel. Everyone in society has a vested interest in protecting the commonwealth. Yet there are quite a few that have forgotten the two aspects of acquisition and cultivation. They've forgotten the hierarchy of needs and the need for basics in all things. Left to politicians and bureaucrats, the commonwealth gets depleted, and undoubtedly democracy, understood as mob rule, only accelerates the problems of taking a very short-sighted view of resource allocation. Again, bureaucracies are bastions of socialism. They do not know how to rationally allocate resources to their highest-valued ends according to customer demand. Politics is a distorting factor in resource allocation. We see this in times of crisis, just like the two hurricane examples I mentioned. Anyone that has been in the military or deployed to a combat zone can attest to the absurdity of your tax dollars at work. Left under political and bureaucratic management, resources will be depleted, and public benefits are merely tangential to feeding the political bureaucratic machine. Politicians and civil servants do not lose their self-interest once they enter government office. This is why the Constitution for the United States limited the authorities to specifically enumerated tasks, and revenues collected under law can only be used in furtherance of these limited powers. Yet the Constitution has quite obviously failed at limiting the general government to its proper scope and sphere. Protecting the commonweal, or the commonwealth to use the political term, requires active participation from all parties to the contract. Again, this is why the Second Amendment needs to be taken in context with Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16. We, the people, organized, armed, and trained to execute laws, repel invasions, and suppress insurrections, is all about self-government. Governments will not limit themselves. Left unchecked, they will spend the commonweal to the point of mass deprivation. Cultivating a prosperous society requires the protection of private property, freedom of contract, and the rule of universal laws. Remember, good law only has two real statements. Do all that you have agreed to do, and do not encroach upon other people or their property. This encompasses contract and criminal law. It's very easy to recognize when a crime has occurred by using this universal standard. Contracts, however, are more complex. The United States Constitution is also a contract for services. Ensuring that each service is carried out faithfully has proven to be quite a challenge. Protecting the collective komibitsu, the commonweal, is why citizen warriors need to be engaged in active self-government now more than ever. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Everyday Samurai and look forward to seeing you next time. Be sure to subscribe to our feed so as to stay up to date with our latest offerings. If you like what you've heard here, give us a thumbs up or a five-star review. Share it with a friend or someone you think that would benefit from this message. Remember, you can get our Tactical Pen Basics Manual as a bonus with the purchase of any tactical pen at shop.everydaysamurai.life. You'll get a great tool for your everyday carry and some great info on mindset, training, and tactics as well. That's shop.everydaysamurai.life. Get yours today and carry it with you wherever you go. Until next time, stay sharp, stay aware, and be well. <laughs>